Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you are ready to kind of dive into the second part to this. Um, it, it's been an enjoyable week for me diving in and digging in. Um, this, if, if you're with me, you've heard this story quite a bit. You've, it focuses, if you've heard this story quite a bit like I have, it focuses more on the prodigal than it ever really does on the older, on the older brother. We spend a lot of time on the prodigal. And, and to be quite frank with you, it's easy to spend time on the prodigal. And let's be real with what that looks like. It's a lot easier to look at someone who we know is in, is in bad shape. It's a lot easier to just look at the person that we know is away from God. Are you with me? It really is. It's a lot easier just to look there and not look here. And that's why I think, and I can only speak for Russ Counts. I can't speak for the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pastors throughout the decades. I think that's why we know that story so much better is because it's easier to look that way than it is to look this way. And today, this entire story takes a flip, it takes a reversal. Let me explain that reversal to you. In The Prodigal Son, this, this story that we're looking at, it, it takes a, a, a unique switch, and it goes to an angle in which the Pharisees are confronting Jesus. And they see who he's with. They see that he's with the people in this room that some of us would really have a hard time even saying. He's with the tax collectors. That's an easy one for us to say. But he's not with some of the people that we would want to even say he's with. He's with the harlots and the, and the sex addicts. I mean, he's with the, the, the drug addicts. He's with the, the people of the age that we can communicate with. He's with them. And the Pharisees, who were ultra spiritual by their own announcement, are saying to Jesus, hey, you can't be holy you can't be what you are because of who you're with. And it creates this conversation that Jesus is going to have with them. You see, Jesus is, is not afraid to have conversations. He's just not. He's not afraid to have a conversation with you and I that is really, really open and real. So Jesus begins the conversation. He says, listen, the love of the Father, the love of God is, is like, it's like when a shepherd loses a sheep. He, he searches for that sheep, and he goes way out of his way to find that sheep, and he rejoices when he finds it. And he wants others to rejoice with him because what was lost is now found. It's, it's, that's what it's like for me to be with the tax collectors and those that you don't think are that good. It's, it's kind of like this, Mr. Pharisee. It's kind of like... When a lady loses a coin and, and it's really very important that she finds it and she searches her whole home and she looks under everything and she moves things apart and she knows it can't be there, but she moves it anyway and she searches. And when she finds it, she's excited. There's this, this oh, there's this relief. There's this, 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 oh, that feels good. And you all know what I mean by that. And he says to them, that's, what it's like for me to be with the tax collectors and these people that you don't want to be with. And it's like when a, when a son, a father with two sons, it's like one of those sons just comes in and finally says, I want my stuff. I want my own life. I want the grass is greener. I want to do my thing. I wish you were dead, father. Just give me what I want. I wish to leave you, but I want what you have promised me, and I want it now. And that son comes to himself and realizes how good the father is to him. And he starts making his way home, and the father reaches out and looks out and sees him and runs through town and pulls up his, his, his garment and exposes his legs, which is shameful. And he gets through town and through everybody to get to his son, to hug his son. And he gets through them all so that he can protect 
his son before the other people see him and ridicule and shame and guilt him. He wraps himself around him and he takes it. And he looks at the prodigals and he says, that's what it's like for me, Jesus, to be with the tax collectors and the sinners. And today I want to review just a bit from last week and then launch into this flip side whereas Jesus is now expressing to them, these Pharisees, what it's like for him to be with the tax collectors. And he says, now what I want you to see, Pharisees, is what it's like for me to be with you. What it's like for me to be with you who are obviously earthly more holy than the others. And the whole thing flips. Have you ever had a conversation about someone to someone? And before you could finish the conversation, the person that you were talking to about someone else, the person you were talking to starts talking about you. Have you ever had that happen? Not many, huh? Not many. You see, a true friend in God, if you're talking about someone to someone, will stop you and say, why are you talking about them? And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. The Pharisees say, why are you da 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 He says, this is what it's like, this is what it's like, this is what it's like. And then he says, but wait a minute, why are you talking about them? And it gets pretty intense in a loving manner. Have you ever had intensity so, so powerful, but it was love instead of anger or hostility? We look at intensity sometimes as something that is violent or aggressive. But today I want you to see intensity in a deep, loving manner. And that may be difficult to process right now. But as we get to the end of this day, I hope that you will see the love of the Father as an intense love. Lord, I pray that today you will let us see just what you were showing through the, the voice of Jesus. And I pray, God, we would be acceptable to hear what you have to say. I pray, God, you would give us a clean look at, at ourselves. But, God, more importantly, I pray, God, you would show us a, a really clear, clean look at, at you, Abba Father. In your name we pray. Amen. I say that review to do this. I, I really want to focus in for just a few minutes on, on the older brother. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15, verses 25 to 32. And before we actually get there, so you can go ahead and turn there. Before we get there, I want to take just a moment and give you this. Part one was the prodigal son, and it also entailed the father. Part two is the older brother, and it entails the father. The father is always in the mix. And I want you to take that. God is always in your life. God is always in your life. He's always in the mix. You may not think he is, but he's always in the mix. He's always there to guide you through, even though you don't want to. When we left off last week, we left off of this. And I want you to see this verse in verse number 24 of chapter 15. It says, for this my son was dead, is live again. He was lost and is now found. And he began to be merry. The father began to be merry because what was dead is alive and what was lost is found. I mean, that's, that's got to be exciting. I, I don't know about you, but he carries through with his theme. What was lost is found. It's a good thing. It's amazing. A couple weeks ago, I lost something that had value to me and I couldn't find it for the life of me. And we've gone through some some remakes in the home, and, and I lost track of this thing, and it was driving me nuts. And I really didn't want to tell anybody in the home because that person, my wife, gave it to me. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't ask her if she's seen it because didn't she know I lost it? And I'm searching, and I'm searching, and literally I searched for about a week. Searched my office up and down three or four times. I searched my bedside where all of my stuff is. And trust me, I got stuff. 
searched my closet. I searched everywhere I could think. And then I began to search the garage because when we went through the shift in the house, some of the stuff got put in the garage. It shouldn't have been in the garage, but it ended up in the garage. Have you ever had stuff that gets where you don't believe it could be? <laughs> After about a week, all of a sudden in the garage, I found it in a box in the bottom of the box. I'm like, oh, 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 I found it. Oh, oh, and trust me, I know exactly where it is now. But there is this enormous relief when you find something that was lost that has value to you. There is this powerful like, oh, I can't even describe it. But you know what I mean. And it really feels good. And this is exactly what the father felt when he got to his son and he went through town and he, he did all this stuff. And we went through that last week. But from here on out, he changes the game. We stopped right here, but it went further with the, the younger brother. And I want to just share that with you because it's going to tie with the older one just sh separately. In, in this section, second, after this point, he, he brings his son through town to the home. And when he gets to the home, you'll read that he, he actually puts things on his son. Read with me, verse number, uh, let me catch it real quick. Verse number 24, then let's get to... Um, Let's back up to verse number 22. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put on a ring on his hand and the sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let's eat and be merry. All right, so here's what happens. This son of his, whew, comes back home. And in the culture of the day, the, the father should have just let him sit out there at the gate of the city and, in shame. In the culture of the city, the father would just stay at his home, and people would tell him, your son's back, and he's like, good, let him sit. Let him think on what he's done. Let him process all that he's done to the family, to me, to his brother, to himself. Let him just stew on it. Let it really sink in. But this father didn't do that. This father didn't allow any of that to happen. This father didn't even question doing something that the culture said to do. He just immediately said, I keep looking, I keep looking, I keep looking, I keep looking. I know one day he's coming home. I know one day he's coming home. I keep looking, I keep looking. There he is. And off he goes. And instead of saying, where have you been? What have you done? Is there anything left? What? Son, you look terrible. Instead of saying any of that, he just immediately says, go get him the best robe. The best robe would have been the father's robe. It would have been the father's robe set aside only for the most important day in the life of that man. It would have been that robe. And they would have gone and gotten that robe and said, now go get him the ring. And the ring would have been a signet ring used to put a stamp into things. So now the son who had gone wayward, <laughs> who understood his role now, who understood what he's done, and the, the father just does questions, none of it, says, get him the ring. He has the same authority as I do. When his stamp goes on, it means I said so. My son has my authority. And he says, son, go get him some sandals. Because in those days, slaves had no sandals. Slaves had no sandals. The family had sandals. That tells me that when he was off on his own, he probably sold his sandals I want you to understand something. All that he just gave this son should have gone to the older son. According to culture, that robe was set aside for the father and the son in charge. The son in charge was expecting to wear that robe one day when it was given to him and only him. That ring would have been a ring for the older son 
who was in charge of all of the estate, who was given that ring. He knew that ring was coming. He knew that moment was coming when that ring would be placed on his finger. He probably felt it for a long time. And those sandals, man, I'm telling you what, I remember when I was a little boy and I got to put my dad's shoes on. You ever had that? You ever feel that feeling when you put on those, those, those man shoes? When you're a little boy and you put on man shoes, man, you're like, yeah. That's what it would have been like for the son to put on high-level shoes from his dad. And his dad just brought him right on in, man, killed the fatted calf, and we have a party. The fatted calf would have been reserved only for a special day. And that special day would have been reserved only for the, the honoring of the oldest son at one point. The fatted calf was a special, special thing. They didn't eat a lot of meat in those days, so this was super honoring. But the father says, kill the fatted calf. What was lost is a is found what is alive, what is dead is now alive. Kill it, let's be merry, I am happy. And the party begins. The party begins. Have you ever been to one of those parties that you just, you're just so happy to be at? It really is. I don't, I don't know that I've ever been to a party that I can picture that would have been like this one. Just, I mean, just happiness. All over the place. Without worry, without care, without just happy, happy. And I, and I think we need to illustrate that what Jesus is talking about is actually the, the happiness of heaven over one who is found. That type of joy is what he's trying to explain to these Pharisees. This is that joy. This is that party. This is that thing. And, and so you got to understand this wasn't a party for the prodigal, this was a party for the father. The father threw the party for his joy. Sometimes we think that he threw the party for the prodigal. He threw the party for his joy of the prodigal being home. We don't normally do something like that. How many of you throw a party for yourself? There's some of you in here, I know. Hey, I'm having a birthday party. Who's it for? Me. Hey, I'm having a promotion party for myself. Come and for yourself. Isn't that? No, this is the father who's throwing a party for himself, for what his son has done. Let me ask you a quick question. Did you know? Did you know? That when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, a party happened in heaven for God because you came home. Let that sink in. Let that sink in because I, don't, I think some of you aren't believing it right now. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you placed your trust and faith in him to forgive you of all your sins and to pay that debt. When you did that, a party exploded in heaven of pure joy for God that you came home. Oh, man. And guess what? The party's going on without you. <laughs> but one day when you do get there and you don't need to get there too soon, you will catch up to a party. You will catch up to a party the likes of you've never seen. It's going to be amazing. Now let's flip back. That's the prodigal. The older brother, woo, this is a different story. This is a completely different story. Let me, let me set it in motion. We had a flip there, huh? This is where we're at. Let's read with me verses 25 through 32, and let's break this thing down so we can grab it, and then we'll get back to the father because... It's an amazing thing. Verse number 25. Now, the older son was in the field, and he came and drew near the house and heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, what do these things mean? And he said to him, your brother has come home, and because he's received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf 
Everything's exciting right now. Don't you see it? Can you hear my voice? Everything is good. Everything is awesome. This is great. But don't you hate when that jumps in there? But. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out to plead with him. So he answered and said to him, Father, lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at, at any time, and yet you never gave me a, a young goat that I might be make merry with my friends. But as soon as his son, this son of yours, wow, came who devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him? And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again. And he was lost and is found. This story, just a few verses goes from yes, yes, to what, 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 to yes, yes. Jesus is always going to stay on the yes, yes for his kids. He will always stay on the, oh, yes, yes. It was right for us to do this. What's he saying? Who is this older son? The older son is the Pharisee. For a long time, I saw it as, you know, the older son has a right here. I can see it. I can see where he's going to be angry. I can picture it. I can understand where he's at. Guess what? I'm the older brother in my family. I can truly see it. But when I look at it through the eyes of God, I'm ashamed at what I saw. Because it immediately placed me as a Pharisee. And now, Jesus turns this coin back around and says, now, I want you guys to see what you look like. I want you to see what you look like. I broke this down. I took some of the, some of the words and I, and I see he, he was out in the field. Out in the field, meaning he was out doing his thing. He was out doing his work. He was away from the home. He was away from the family. Yet he was still in the family. He was in, but he wasn't in. He was physically there, but not mentally there. He was physically there, but his heart was nowhere near connected. He was out in the field doing his job, doing his role. He could hear music. That tells me the party was going, man. The party was rocking. And Jesus says he could hear music and dancing. And dancing. That means there's a whole lot of hoopla going on. And as he enters, he gets close. He asks the slave, what is going on? And now, culturally, there should not have been a party that the oldest son, the heir to the throne of the home, should not have been in part of planning. In that culture, he would have been a major part of planning. The father would have said, let's do this. And the son says, okay, all right. Because the father would have been training him on how to, how to do this. And the, the older son would have been every bit in the planning of it. Now we have this gigantic party going on without the son ever knowing. And the son is finding out information such as your brother's home. Hmm. And he killed the fatted calf. Hmm. And they're having a great time without you. And he gets angry. He gets angry. Has something good ever happened that you felt like you should be a part of, but you weren't invited and you got angry? Yeah, man. Yeah. Have you ever gotten so excited for somebody else to achieve something? Or have you thought to yourself, how come they got that and I'm still where I'm at? How come they get this and I'm still, Lord, what? Have you ever just kind of gotten there? Then you can totally connect with this guy. You can totally connect with this, this, this older brother who is like walking up and going, you've got to be kidding me. You've absolutely got to be kidding me. This, this brother of, of, of my dad's. 
has come home, and now my dad's having a blast with him. This ticks him off. This ticks him off. How many times in, in our lives, and I'm not going to ask for hands because, to be honest with you, some of you are much better than I am when it comes to this type of thing. Have you gotten just, I mean, you're just like sick and tired of somebody else succeeding. And you're like, you know what? Why do I even try? Let me give you this tidbit. I don't have it in my PowerPoint. I, I'm just going to give you this tidbit. Two things, and, and I hope you'll mentally write this down or write this down in your digital format or something. But God will always give you a test that you can pass. God will always give you a test that you can pass. Satan will always give you a temptation that you will fail. God gives you a test you can pass. Satan gives you a temptation that you'll fail. The goal of God is to pass. The goal of Satan is to fail. What we need to do is we need to start looking at things. Is this a test or is this a temptation? Which one is this man getting hit? He's getting hit with what? It was a test. But he took it as a temptation. And it's a scary place to be, folks. Scary place to be. As we look at this, I want you to look at this. In the NIV, I think it really has a good way of saying this. Verse number, verse number 25. In my Bible, it says this. It says, um, now the older son was in the field, and he came and drew near the house and heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what it meant. And he said to him, your brother has come home, and he's just, he's just starting to get cranked up now. And your, your dad's received him safe and sound, and your dad's even killed the fat of calf. And now he's really cranking up his anger, and he's getting ticked now. And he said he was angry and would not go in. Verse number 29, so he answered and said to him, lo, lo, and my Bible says lo. The father comes out to him. The son won't go into the party, so the father goes out to him. And in my Bible, it says, lo, but I want you to get, in the NIV, it says, look. Look. This is a classic phrase of someone who has no care for respect. The father pleads with him to come in. And instead of saying, dad, dad, he says, look, dad. Whoa. Whoa. I guarantee you, I'm going to be real with you. If one of my kids says to me, look, Dad, we're going to have a look, all right. <laughs> right? This was an intense piece. The next one is he says, I've been serving you. In other words, I've been slaving for you. I've been slaving for you. The next one, never disobeyed your orders. In my, my version, it says commandments. He's just laying it out. He says, you've never even given me a kid or a small goat for my friends to be merry. You, you, never, never. When you get into conversation with you, you, never, never, you're in never, never land. <laughs> because it's really all about you. This is an intense conversation where the father comes out to him and pleads with him to come in. And I'll get to that just shortly. But the father is, the, the father is pleading with him and the, the son is just angry as all get out. Let me break this down for you. It says this, look, look, look means I've had enough. I've had enough. You've tried. I'm tired of you looking like a fool and shaming this family. I'm the heir. I'm the next guy. I'm the guy that everybody's asking in town, what is your dad doing? I have to take the heat for you. Dad, what are you doing? Wake up. Stop being so old. Are you with me? It's pretty harsh, wouldn't you say? Slaving for you means he was all about a works. A works. In other words, a performance mentality. I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. Well, great, good for you. Guess what? 
You were supposed to. When your kids say, well, I took out the trash. Good, you were supposed to. Well, I fed the dogs. Good, you were supposed to. Right? But when we start thinking, when we start thinking that I did this and this and this, when we, really, we were supposed to. Well, I read my Bible. Good, you were supposed to. Well, I prayed. Good. You're supposed to. Well, I tithed. Good. You're supposed to. But when we start looking at those as chores, now we're in trouble. Young people in the room, your chores aren't there for you just to supposed to. They're there for you to honor your parents by doing them in a rightful manner. They're there for you to do them in such a way that you're respecting them and loving them by doing those chores. That's what they're about. And once in a while, they may compensate you for it. And if they aren't, talk to them about it, not me. (laughs) Adults in the room, reading your Bible, young people in the room, reading your Bible, that is not a chore. You do that to get to know your father. It is not a chore. If you're just checking off the box that you read a chapter today, I'm glad that you're doing it. But really, are you getting to know him? Are you just checking a box? Are you just saying, I've done this? When you pray, are you really spending time and getting to know the father and talking with the father and asking him to reveal things to you so that you can better know him? Or are you just praying, okay, I've got my prayer time in. Good. Yesterday it was three minutes. Today it's down to two minutes and a half. Go ahead. Good. Got it done. Got to shave time where I can. When you tithe, are you begrudgingly writing that that check or or swiping it on the PayPal? Are are you begrudgingly doing it because you know you're supposed to? Or are you saying, man, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. I give you 100% of who I am, and I'm grateful that you give me 90 plus your insurance and your interest, and I get to live like I get to live. I get to. Thank you, Lord. Are, you, are, are we there? Or are we just, look what I, look what I, look what I, look what I. This is where this guy's at. He's fair sacred. That's look what I, look what I, look what I. Let's move. Never disobeyed your command. This means he's in a commander mentality, like military. He is one who will recount why he's valuable. Hmm. Have you ever gotten disappointed in someone? Because they shunned you, did you wrong, and you went back to them and told them exactly why they, this, look at what I, look, if without me, you are ba 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 Without me, you would ba 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 I do this, 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 and this so that you don't have to. Whew, that's a tough one on marriage, isn't it? That's exactly where he's at. He's got a commander mentality. He's looking at his father as the, as the authority in the life, and he was going to eventually tell his dad, this is what I've done for you, and I will recount them all so that you understand how valuable I am. You see where this guy's at? I'm sure none of us have been there, right? Intense. I know. We're going to brighten it up here in a few minutes. Whoops, I went too far. I need to go back one more. Never gave me. This is really intense. He says, woe is me. Now that I've just laid it out for you, I want you to know. You, you've just never done anything for me. Woe is me. I mean, you should have known that I wanted to have friends, friends over and, and, and party. With, I mean, of course, without you. But you should have known that I wanted to have my friends over in the back part of the house where no one's around. You should have known that, that I wanted you to supply me with what I needed to have friends over to have fun, but not you be there. Let's get real with it for a minute. Are we there? Have we ever been there? Have we ever said, God, I want you to bless me with this, this, and this, but I don't want you to really interfere with it. God, I want you to give me a raise, but I don't want to have to tithe on the raise. God, I, I want you to send me on a, on a trip and, and I'll enjoy the whole thing and never thank you for it. Do you see where he's at? 
God, you show favoritism. The older son's saying, man, you know, you've never even given me a kid. You show favoritism. I don't even get a small goat for my friends, and you give this son of yours the fatted calf, a robe, a ring, or sandals. You give him the world, and he's done nothing but but ba 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 Let's be real for a minute. I know it's harsh, but have, have you ever just thrown up on somebody? Now listen to me. Have you ever thrown up on somebody and they weren't there to take it? Right? Are you with me? This is what this young man's doing. He's throwing up all over his, his, his dad, and his dad's there to take it. And he's throwing up all over his brother, and his brother's not there to take it. Do you see where this guy's at? Now, just for a small moment, for just a small moment, can you close your eyes and can you honestly say, you know what, there's parts of this guy I can relate to. Are you with me? There's just parts of this guy I can relate to. Okay, let's move to the Father, okay? Okay. We've been down, we've examined things, we've looked at ourselves. Let's move to the Father. And I, want, I want you to see the Father. The Father in verse number, let me, let me make sure I get it right here. Verse number 28. The older son was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out to plead with him. So the party's happening, and the father finds out that his son won't come in. And it could have been the very same little guy that he asked, what's going on? And the slave says, hey, man, there's your, your brother's home. It's exciting. There's a party. And he may have told him, well, I'm not going in. I'm not going in. And that pro- probably look, the little guy got scared out of his mind because the brother was the rightful heir to the home. And he probably scared out of his mind. And somebody says, what's wrong with you? He said, He's not going in. He's really mad. Really mad. Have you known anybody in your life get so mad that people were afraid that you were mad? (coughs) I'm sorry to cough. It's just working up. This man was so mad, the little guy was probably too scared to tell anybody. And somebody came in and said, what's wrong with you? He's really mad, man. He's mad. I've never seen him that mad. He gets mad, but not that mad. He's mad. You know, I'll be honest with you. I think the older brother finally had a reason to get mad. He just couldn't hold it, couldn't suppress it anymore. He just blew up. This is one of those get real days. Have you ever blown up? Where you just couldn't hold it up anymore. You just couldn't suppress it down no more. It just finally just, bah! And everybody around you is like, whoa, where'd that come from? Six years of this. You know? Not healthy to suppress that stuff, folks. Not healthy. Because when you throw up that big, you can do some serious damage. It's going to take a long time to repair. That's exactly where he's at. The, the, da- the father comes out to him, and he, and he says to him, I'm, I'm going to entreat the son. I'm going to entreat him. You know, and that's one of the words in, in my Bible. Your Bible may say pleaded with him. Um, and that literally means this. It says to, to ask and make an earnest request. It means the father came out to him and asked him in an earnest request to please come in. Please come in. Would you please come in? This takes me to Philemon. In the book of Philemon, verses, I think it's eight and nine, Paul is writing to Philemon and he says, you know, this this guy's really messed up. And and to be honest with you, in Christ, I I could command you to take him back, but I would rather you make that decision. And the father comes out to him and pleads with him, and the father had the right to command him to come in. Let me put it this way. The father had the right to command him to come in and put a smile on it. Are you with me? How many of you have ever used the phrase, you're going to be happy if I so help me. (laughs) When we go in there, you're going to smile and you're going to be good. Trust me, guys. Let's be real. I've done that. My daughter's in the front row. She knows I've done that to her. It's not fair. It's not fair. 
Guess what? This father didn't. Why? Because this father, an example of, is of the Heavenly Father. This father in this is Jesus talking about his dad. And this dad did not do that. This dad said, I could command you to come in, but I'm not going to. I'm going to lovingly ask you to come in. I'm going to earnestly ask you to come in. And then the son throws up all over him and gets all kicked off and does all this stuff. And the father continues to move forward and loves on him, hears him out. And then the father does what is just blows my mind, and I'll, I'll get down to the, the nitty-gritty with the father. Because I've had a time this week to just really embrace Abba Father. Dad. Daddy. You see, I've got, a, I've got an earthly dad that I love. And as years go by, I'm getting to know him even better and better than I did as a kid. And it helps me understand him so much more now. We also have a heavenly father. Heavenly Father looks just like this. Even though I'm angry, Heavenly Father puts his arm around and says, come on. Come on. Come on in. Come on in. I want you to come on in. I know you're mad. It's okay. Verse number 31 says this. These are the pieces that we pulled out of it. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. And, and to break this down, son means my child. Sometimes we miss this in the translation. It says son. And we can think of it as like, son. But really what he was saying is, my child, I know you're hurting. I know you're angry. I know you feel what you feel. But you're still my son. You're still my child. You're always with me. In other words, God says, I've never lost sight of you. I always know where you're at, even though you don't want me to. Heavenly Father says, I always know where you're at. And, and I'm always accessible to you. I've never lost sight of you, and all that I have is yours. I mean, my family inheritance is, is yours if you just ask. This implies that the father would have done anything for his son if he just asked. But the son had distanced himself from the father, and the son, even though he was not the prodigal, he was just as much a prodigal. He just didn't have the guts to leave. He was just living in the same roof just as angry and upset and discouraged at his father because his father was doing the right thing. I want you to hear this real quick. That what the son, the older son did by not going into the party, get this, culturally was just as much a disgrace as the prodigal leaving home. Let that sink in. It was literally culturally the exact same disgrace. He finally had it. What did the father do to the prodigal when he asked to go home? He embarrassed himself, he shamed himself, and he gave him what he needed and, left, and he left in love. He left in a way in which he could come home. Do you get that? His son was determined to leave, and he said, okay, son. Okay, son. I'm going to let you leave. I'll give you what you ask. And he let his prodigal son go in a way in which he could return home. Now we get to this one, and this son is so angry, he's going to disgrace his dad and the family in such a way it's just like the prodigal under his own the same roof, and he's saying to him, son, I'm going to let you be this way, and I want you to know you can still come home. You can still come home. 
you know, as I said, this week it really challenged me on, on this Abba Father. Because this Father blows my mind. Because it dawned on me that I can tell God anything. And I've always known that, right? Would you agree with me? We can tell God anything? Huh? And then I just, I just took my time and I really processed that. And then I just closed my eyes. So if you would just join me, it's nothing crazy. I'm not going to do anything weird. I'm not going to come pick your ear while your eyes are closed or nothing. I just want you to, if you would join me, just in a small little exercise, I want you to just close your eyes, nothing crazy. I just want you to think about something for a minute with me. With your eyes closed, that way you can really focus on it. Some of you may choose to join us. Some of you may choose to do it with your eyes open. I don't care. I just want you to really think on this. Think about your earthly father. Have you got a clear picture of him? And I want you to think back to some of the things in your life that you've never told him. Your earthly father, some of the things that you've never told him, never expressed to him. Because it may have been because you were, fear, you were fearful to tell him. It may have been that it would cause you some discomfort. It may have been that it would shame you. It may have been that you just didn't feel comfortable to talk to him. It may have been that your father didn't believe in your dreams, so you stopped telling him about them or your goals. I would dare say that as you picture your earthly dad, there's probably some things that you never told him for distinct reasons because of possible ramifications, whatever that is. But now I want you to move your mental look to the Heavenly Father. And I want you to embrace that you can tell him everything because he already knows it. It's not a mystery to him like the earthly father. He already knows your goals and dreams that you are afraid to tell. He already knows the areas in your life that you're ashamed of or feel guilty about because he already knows. He's already forgiven them. He even knows all of those things that are in your mind that you've never, ever, ever told anyone. You just bury him, hoping that the thoughts will go away. And he's there, and he says, just tell me. Nothing catches him off guard. I want you to see that as good of a heavenly father we can have, and as good as an earthly father we can have, man, the heavenly father sent his son to die on a cross to pay for every, every, every shameful guilt, thought, emotion, pharisaical avenue you've been down. So when you go to the Heavenly Father, you can go to Him at liberty and at pure freedom and just say to Him, Wrap your arms around me, Dad. Thank you for loving me for who I am. Thank you that your Heavenly Father never looks at you weird. Thank you that your Heavenly Father never never makes you wait on Him to talk to Him. Lord, we come to you today. As we close this out, I just want to thank you, Father God, Abba, Father. 
that you have blessed us with the right. You've placed a robe upon all of us who know your son Jesus as his Lord and Savior. You've placed a robe upon all of us. We're no longer a slave, we're family. You've placed sandals on our shoes and you've given us a signet ring of, of familyhood with you, Father. Oh, Lord, we come, each one of us, with some form of baggage that we've never shared with anyone. But thank you, God, that we can share it with you. Because it is not a mystery to you. You are not embarrassed. You are never disgraced. You're always loving. You call us child. You could command us. You could rightly command us, Lord, but you don't. Whether we're acting pharisaical, you love us. Whether we're acting prodigal, you love us. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the loving Father. Who has his arms open wide. Lord, I pray that we as a church will embrace you. And that we will come home. Really come home and be at peace in your presence. Because God, without you, we're nothing. You are our life because you gave us life. You are our eternity because you gave us everlasting eternity through your son. You are our daddy because we placed our faith in Jesus and you made us heirs to you, adopted into the family with all the same rights. Thank you. Thank you. pray. Amen.